of trying to break down NZ and just give you kind of a broad overview on, on what that means. So I'm going to do my best this morning to, to give you a better understanding into what NZ means. As, as Stephen said, I work at the National Construction Training Centre here in Mount, Mount Lucas. We have one of the centres of excellence in NZ and retrofit, and I'll, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that later on. So just, I guess, to give you a background in NZEB, first of all, why are we talking about NZEB? Why are we moving towards nearly zero energy buildings? And when I was making this presentation yesterday, I wanted to kind of, of give you a, um, a better understanding, I guess, or a bit of background. So I just grabbed some headlines, um, all recent. I mean, this one is from November 7th, but time running out to act on climate change. Michal Martin arriving there at COP27, and we all know that that's happening in Sharm el Sheikh at the minute. Um, another one here, again, a recent headline, what climate change report says about Ireland, flooding, heat waves, and when they could happen. So we're all worried about this one and a half degree Celsius temperature um, increase and, and what that could mean for the planet. Again, the 4th of November, this is coming from the IGBC. So carbon emissions associated with the construction, buildings, and infrastructure sector account for approximately a third of Ireland's emissions. So that ultimately is what the main concern is and the motivation for moving towards nearly zero energy. If we look at that in, in statistics, the construction and built environment sectors account for 37% of Ireland's national carbon emissions. And that conversation is happening across the board. You know, How are we reducing carbon emissions in our transport sector, in our agricultural sector? But we also need to look at the built environment sector there as well. Yeah, if we break that down even further, we've got our heating, cooling and lighting in our buildings account for approximately 23% of that. And then the remaining 14% is, is embodied carbon. And that conversation is starting to become more prevalent now as well. And you'll hear more about that um, in, in the future. So I guess where did NZEB come from or what's the background on it? Essentially, it's all coming from um, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, which is a European directive originally published in 2002. It was recast in 2010 and then it was recast again in 2018. But it, it essentially we're hoping to reduce our CO2 emissions by 51% by 2030. And like I've already said, we need to focus on the built environment. We need to aim to reach carbon neutrality by 2050 in order to, to slow down or stop climate change. We're all very aware of the fact that we're experiencing these unrealistic or, or incredible um, weather conditions at the minute. I mean, I was um, helping my brothers build a shed at the weekend and I went equipped for November farming, um, two pairs of trousers, two hoodies. And I was peeled down to my t-shirt in, in a matter of minutes because it was so warm, 17 degrees on a Saturday in November. I mean, I mean we're, we're all very worried about what's happening in, with regards to climate. So essentially, we now need to take more responsibility to slow down or stop climate change. Um, and like I said, we're focusing on the transport sector. We're focusing on the agriculture sector. We also need to focus on, on the construction sector. So the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive is a European um, legislation. It was pushed out to all of the individual member states. And essentially, NZEB started being mentioned in the 2010 recast. So each member state was given its own ownership on NZEB. And Ireland published these two documents in 2019. Um, so part L, technical guidance document L, and technical guidance document F were both published hand in hand in 2019. And this is essentially where NZEB comes from. So it's the conservation of fuel and energy in dwellings. And then in tandem with that, we need to have an understanding of the ventilation regulations. As I said, they were both originally published in 2019. TGDL has since been revised in 22. Both documents must be looked at together in order to meet NZEB compliance. So what's actually, um, what is actually NZEB and what does that mean for us? And we have this schematic here at Mount Lucas. It's, it's considered to be the seven steps to NZEB. And I'm going to use that as my basis for this lesson today. So nearly zero energy building is a building that has a very high energy performance. The nearly zero or very low amount of energy required should be covered to a very significant extent by energy from renewable sources. 
including energy from renewable sources produced on site or nearby. And that's coming from the EPBD. Essentially, it's a comfort standard. So we're trying to build a highly insulated, highly airtight, well-ventilated home that costs very little to run um, and burns very little carbon. And then we're going to also produce renewable energies on site or nearby. That's what NZEB is in a nutshell. But ideally, we're going to have high levels of comfort in an NZEB dwelling. So the three key targets for NZEB in an Irish con context are to reduce the energy performance. Um, and when, when we're doing that, we're comparing it to the existing housing stock. Most of us live in C-rated homes, D-rated homes, E-rated homes, or, or even Gs. And we measure those homes using the BER assessment tool or the DEEP software. So we want to reduce our energy performance coefficient, that EPC figure, and our NZEB dwellings should have an EPC of 0.3. That's when compared to the 2005 building regulations. We also want to reduce our carbon consumption dramatically. So our carbon performance coefficient or our CPC value should be at 0.35. So we're going to consume less electricity. We're going to reduce our carbon consumption. And then finally, we're going to um, have renewable energies in our houses. So we must have a renewable energy ratio or an RER of 20% on all NZEB dwellings in order to comply with NZEB. And that's coming straight from part L of the building regulations. You'll find EPC, CPC and RER littered throughout that document. I just took some, some snapshots there of the BER um, in case you weren't familiar with the rating system. So it rates houses from A to G. And like I said, it's measured using the BER software which is called DEEP, the Dwelling Energy Assessment Procedure. So I guess the first measure that we must take in order to um, reduce the energy consumption in our dwellings is con continuous insulation principle. So here I have my house. I have continuous insulation the whole way around my house. I'm going to have less energy escaping through that house. If we look at the second law of thermodynamics, one of those laws states that heat will always move from hot to cold. So what does that mean for us in a dwelling context? Well, if I've heated my house up to 19 degrees, internal temperature, 19 degrees, and it's four degrees outside, for example, a normal November day, that heat, that thermal energy that's inside in my house is trying to escape however it can. Now, thermal energy will move in three ways. It'll move in um, convection, it'll move through conduction, or it'll move through radiation. But essentially, it'll escape through one of those three measures out of my house. So I'll have heat escaping through my walls, through my floor, through my um, ceilings, uh, through my roof, through my windows. However, it can escape through conduction, convection, or radiation. So with my NZ dwellings, and again, taken straight from technical guidance document L, there are backstop U values that we must achieve in an NZEB dwelling. So you can see there the backstop U values for your, um, for your roofs, for your walls, um, for your floors, etc. So 0.18 here, 0.18, 0.16. So we're trying to get our continuous insulation principle. Interestingly, the average U value for our windows is 1.4. So that would be a standard double glazed unit, average U value at 1.4. But our windows form part of our insulation layer. We're talking about continuous insulation principle. We have 0.18s, 0.16s, 0.18s, maybe 0.2, depending on the house type if it's flat roof detail. And then we have 1.4 here. So, you know, almost 10 times less performing or, or worse than your, your insulation in your attic, in your floor, et cetera. But that's one of the first ways that we're going to double down um, on heat loss in our NZEB dwellings. The second way that we're gonna double down is, is through air tightness and vapor control measures. So by insulating everywhere, we're gonna stop heat loss through conduction, but we still will have heat loss through convection, so drafts. And remember, we're talking about NZEB as a comfort standard. So we want to minimize drafts where possible. 
So by implementing air tightness and vapor control measures in your house, and that's my red line here, I now have um, a continuous airtight vapor control layer around my home. And again, taken from technical guidance document L, each NZEB home must have an air permeability level of below five meters cubed per hour per meter squared. So how do I achieve that? Well, there's loads of different ways of achieving air tightness, but the most common way in most homes now would be by installing um, tapes and membranes around your windows, at your floor to wall junction, at your wall to ceiling junction, um, and, and at various intervals, you can see two of these pictures here. Some of you might ask, how do you measure your air permeability? Air permeability is measured with the blower door test. And in change in the technical guidance document L, since 2019, every new home needs to have a blower door test to determine air permeability measures. So moving on then to the next principle of NZEB, low thermal bridging. And just a note, I guess, a thermal bridge occurs anywhere that there's a break in the insulation layer. So if I have severe thermal bridging, I'm gonna have things like heat loss because there's gonna be heat loss through conduction. I'll also have condensation and I'll have mold. But more worryingly, I'm gonna have damage to the building fabric as that thermal energy, as that warm vapor laden air escapes to the outside. We don't really want that happening, um, you know, in, in our NZ dwellings. So again, taken straight from the um, gov.ie, the um, technical guidance document L, there is a, a sister document called the acceptable construction details. And within those acceptable construction details, there is a checklist that helps you to minimize thermal bridging. So a thermal performance checklist. There's also an air barrier checklist down the right hand side. So just to draw your attention to the fact that those acceptable construction details exist, um, they're free to download. Um, if you just look up technical guidance documents or acceptable construction details, you'll find this whole suite of construction details. So this is your ground floor insulation above the slab and there will be measures in there to try and minimize thermal bridges and also to ensure that you have a continuous air barrier. We need to have high performing windows because like I said already, we know that the windows are going to be the outlier. My walls have a U value of 0.18. My windows, standard double glazing, maybe have a value of 1.4. So your windows do form part of that insulation layer and you must aim to achieve the lowest U values that you can. Typical, typical double glaze window U values, you're looking at 1.4, 1.5 watts per meter squared Kelvin typical triple glazed windows U values. You could be looking at 0.7, you could be looking at 0.6 here, but 0.8 would be maybe your standard um, if you were talking about an average value. So when we're talking about triple glazing versus double glazing, it is just worth considering. Now there are double glazing windows and there are exceptions that are gonna have you know lower U values than 1.5, please don't get me wrong. But what you're aiming for with windows is there's gonna be a combined U value and it's going to have the lowest U value possible, bearing in mind that your, your wall U value is at 0.18 as a backstop, as a minimum. And then we also have to consider solar gain. So if I have, you know, large windows on the south facing um, wall of my house, how am I going to prevent overheating in the summertime? So it is just worth considering. Then ventilation is the next measure that we need to consider with NZEB. And there are two ventilation strategies outlined in, in technical guidance document F. Technical guidance document F is the ventilation document that goes hand in hand with technical guidance document L. This is a photo of one of the ventilation units here in the training center, so your mechanical ventilation with heat recovery system. So the two strategies that were outlined are natural ventilation and mechanical ventilation. Now, how do I decide what ventilation system to install? Well, it depends on your air permeability value. If your air permeability levels are between three meters cubed per hour per meter squared and five meters cubed per hour per meter squared, you can install natural ventilation. Now, remember five is the backstop. That's the absolute maximum that you can have in an NZ dwelling. Where air permeability levels are less than three meters cubed per hour per meter squared, you must install a mechanical ventilation system in your house. 
Why do you have to do that? Well, because you're building a highly insulated, highly airtight home, we must ensure that you're appropriately ventilating that space. Um, we have one of the, the highest rates of childhood asthma in Europe. We know that we have poor indoor air quality in, in um, premises and homes in Ireland. So there's now a drive on to make sure that those homes and those spaces are adequately ventilated. And technical guidance document F has the calculation methodology to ensure that every house is calculated appropriately. So what types of ventilation systems can I use um, for mechanical ventilation? So you could have mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, MVHR. You could have a continuous mechanical extract ventilation system, CMEV, demand control ventilation system, DCV, um, or you could have decentralized versions of these. It doesn't really matter. As long as it's mechanical ventilation, you're ensuring that there are delivered airflow rates and delivered extract rates into those rooms. Every NZEB dwelling must ensure that appropriate calculated ventilation levels are being delivered. It's so important. Every person working in ventilation must be able to prove competency in design, installation and commissioning of systems. Um, and that's, again, something that's really important and worth knowing as a homeowner. If I have someone coming to install my ventilation system, I can ask them to prove competency. Are you competent to, desi um, to design that system? Are you competent to install that system? And uh, as part of the Leash Off ETB Mount Lucas training facilities here, we actually offer one of the um, City and Guilds accredited um, ventilation um, courses. So WWETV and Lee Shuffle ETV currently offer that, um, that qualification. And then, so you have somebody who's competent in design, somebody who's competent in installing the system, somebody who's competent in commissioning the system. That system then needs to be independently validated by a third party who's N. SAI or INAB approved, and that person is called a validator. So at each stage of install, you have a competent person who is um, responsible for your ventilation system, and then you need to make sure that it's been validated at the end to ensure that, that design rates are correct and that commissioned rates are being delivered. So then we're moving on to high efficiency heating and domestic hot water. And this is where your heat pumps come into play. So we had those backstop values for NZEB earlier, your energy performance coefficient, your carbon performance coefficient and your renewable energy ratio. So your CPC was 0.35. We're trying to reduce our carbon consumption to hit those 2030 targets and 2050 targets. So we need to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels in order to reduce carbon emissions. I live in the Midlands. My parents have um, a, a two story house in the countryside. There is three stoves um, slash ranges in that house and all of them burn turf and timber. So, you know, in terms of carbon emissions, they'd be quite large coming out of that house. We need to look at reducing our reliance on fossil fuels um, in order to hit this CPC value. So we're moving more towards cleaner energies and heat pumps are considered to be extremely efficient because of this value here between 300 and 350%. So the seasonal coefficient of performance of most heat pumps are between 300 and 350%. Now, what does that mean? It means for every unit of energy I um, use or consume, to run that heat pump, I'm converting that into between three and three and a half times that amount of heat energy. So the conversion factor there is between three and three and a half times, um, which is huge. So because of that, they're actually considered renewable technologies. And what you're talking about is, is this sort of, a, uh, you could be talking about a ground source heat pump, an air source heat pump, it doesn't matter, but heat pumps are becoming more popular because of the fact that they're so um, efficient and they're, um, they're, they're positively impacting on your BE or assessment. Then the final step for NZEB is the renewable energy ratio. So like I said earlier, it's 20%. 20% of 
um, regulated load must be produced on site or nearby. That's again coming from technical guidance document L. So your regulated load includes your heating, your cooling, your ventilation, your lighting, and your domestic hot water. It doesn't include appliances, folks. Um, and that's, I guess, because we can't standardize the amount of appliances in any one person's home. But every house we know needs to be heated. Houses in the future will need to be cooled. Houses have some sort of a ventilation loading on them. They also need to be lit and your hot water needs to have electricity as well. So all of these will have a, a loading and they do have an impact um, when it comes to your, your deep assessment, your BER. So 20% of that regulated load now must be produced on site or nearby. And there are different ways that you can meet that trigger in terms of your NZEB dwelling. You could use PV panels on the roof. Um, you could have micro generators. So for example, micro turbines um, or even a, a wood pellet stove could potentially um, go towards that 20% if you were partnering it up with something else. Um, so there is different ways that you could hit that 20% regulated load. But most people, uh, in order to hit NZEB compliance, are partnering a heat pump with solar PV and they're hitting that 20% very, very easily. Because of the fact that you can now feed back into the grid with your solar PV systems and you can get paid for the um, production of excess electricity as well, uh, it, it's looking more and more appealing to um, homeowners. Uh, so it is one of the variables that's measured on the BER. Like I said, we're looking at EPC, we're looking at the CPC, and we're looking at the RER in terms of, of the BER assessment. So finally, I just want to give you a note on the actual Centre of Excellence here in Mount Lucas. So it's a simulated training facility, and here's some pictures. So we have external wall insulation rigs, internal wall insulation rigs. We have a, a fully fledged bungalow here that people can retrofit. Um, and we have attic um, rigs as well. We've got ventilation bays, air tightness rigs. There's loads of stuff happening. Fully funded courses through the Skills to Advance funding mechanism and training has been developed with the Department of Housing, the NSAI, the SEAI, CIF and industry stakeholders. Our qualifications are either City and Guilds Assured, their QQI awards or their industry recognised that we're moving towards QQI certification. Um, if you want to know more about NZEB, we offer a one day course on NZEB. It's City and Guilds Assured, and you can also use it to, to get Siri points. So if anyone is interested in that, I've just popped my email address down there. Um, and that's it from me, folks. Hopefully that wasn't too overwhelming. But that